There we go. Well done, you made it. So our gospel this morning is from Luke's gospel, and I'm sure that you recognize a lot of it from John's gospel, uh, which was, I think we spoke about last week, was it, where we had Thomas, and Thomas wanted to see the hands, the, the wounds and the hands and the wounds in the side. So this is Luke's account of, of that, but it, there's no mention of, of Thomas in it. But the gospel reading starts with these words. While they were talking about this, remember that? While they were talking about this, and then of course you've got to say, well, what are you talking about? How do you mean? So obviously it's referring to what had happened earlier. And what they're talking about is the experience of, of two men. One named Cleopas, who we don't know anything about really, but all we know is his name. And the second man is totally unidentified. And as they walk, they are joined by a stranger who they don't know, and they start, start talking about the empty tomb and the resurrection. And to cut a long story short, he is later identified as Jesus. And we know this incident as the episode on the road to Damascus. And the important thing about that is that Jesus became visible to them, and it was while Jesus celebrated the Eucharist, perhaps who knows, maybe the very first Eucharist after the, after the, um, the Last Supper, um, they suddenly became aware, as he blessed the bread and the wine, as he shared it, they suddenly became aware that it was Jesus. Have I suddenly gone soft, or is it just me? Am I speaking loud enough? Can you hear me at the back? Because I did get a complaint a week or two ago that the people couldn't hear me. You can hear me at the back. Awesome. Um, so the Jesus was revealed to them through the bread and the wine, and later on we're going to hear how Jesus again is revealed to the to the people. So after this, the two men return to Jerusalem, and they meet the eleven disciples. Why only eleven disciples? I thought there were twelve, because Judas has already hanged himself. So they meet with eleven disciples and others in a room. And we can just imagine how terrified the disciples were before they saw Jesus. Remember, they had uh, they were in disarray. They were in, in, in absolute horror because here, who, the person that they had identified as the Messiah was taken, was crucified. They were expecting the door to be broken down any second and to be to be arrested. So there they are. They're terrified. Their world has fallen apart. The, leader has had these horrible trials, six of them have been crucified, in the state of fear and anxiety. And suddenly, Jesus was standing amongst them. Well, what a shock, what a surprise. They, that must have been really quite a surprise. So there was Jesus standing amongst his closest friends, the disciples, and he says, peace be with you. Well, we can just imagine how those disciples felt. They thought, wow, what is going on here? They thought it was a ghost. But now you look at that word peace, because um, Jesus would have used the word shalom, the old Hebrew word shalom. And loosely translated, we come out with peace, or peace be with you. But really, if, if you do a bit of studies into it, you'll see that it's really quite an inadequate attempt to put shalom into English. Uh, or perhaps we just don't realize the importance of that word peace. I don't know which one of you trail out it is. But shalom conveys a lot more than we think. At shalom, it conveys that all is well with the world. All is just. All is fair. All is the way that God meant it to be. So do we think of that when we say peace? When we share the peace a little bit of, 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 of later on, is it simply a matter of going to a friend and shaking a hand and saying, hi, how are you? Are we really saying, all is well, all is well with the world, everything is right, everything about us is actually per uh, perfect. Because ultimately, it also means something like this, and it's a bit of a challenge. It also is a question, what are you doing to make the world look more like God's world than Caesar's world? So that it all encompasses in this world, Shalom in the Hebrew. It's, 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 everything is okay, but at the same time a challenge. What are you doing? Shalom. What are you doing to make the world good, to make it a godly world and not a secular world? And we still have that problem, don't we? At that time it was the Roman world and God's world. Nowadays we have the secular world and we have God's world. 
and we would live in a secular world, we have to get on in a secular world, but really as Christians, as disciples of Jesus, what we are trying to do is we are trying to build God's kingdom right here where we are. It's already begun. It's not something that is happening in the future. We are part of that process. The kingdom is not yet fully established, but we are part of that process to build God's kingdom. Well, back to our disciples, we can imagine. Here is Jesus suddenly standing among us. The dead one, the dead one is standing among us. The dead one is loose. They are terrified. How can it be? How can it be? And he still has shalom on his mind. So here the world is falling apart. Jesus arrives just through the slot door. And he says shalom. And shalom means everything is good. Everything is right in the world. What are you doing to establish God's world? Well, what was he to say? You can imagine how those four disciples were totally confused. Then what does Jesus say? He says, well, why are you frightened? Well, the truth, the last time we saw you, you were dead. You were hanging on a Roman cross. There were soldiers all around. There were angry people all around. And it was far from the dead is dead. How do you mean, why are you frightened? Of course you're frightened. So, upon examining the yes, upon the statue, and upon examining the hands and the feet, and looking for the holes, the holes that the nails went, and remember that it would be a nice one of the nails that we buy at the hardware store today, and it really would have been more like Jacob, spikes going driven through. But then suddenly the disciples are filled with the story, tinged with the speech, and they're not really quite sure what should we believe or shouldn't we? They haven't seen Jesus this year. They still think, well, maybe it's a ghost, but nevertheless, they have that joy. Then the real Jesus stepped forward. And what does he say? He says, have you anything to eat? Well, what a thing to say. Here's all this is happening. He says, well, how about that? Do you have anything to eat? Well, there we go. What's to eat? Sounds like my mother, my grandson, my nine-year-old is always hungry. If you speak to him, are you happy? He's always hungry. Are you tired? He's never tired. Never tired. Always hungry. Good combination. There's Jesus, hungry, what's to eat. So apparently, life is actually very real in the resurrected world. Um, they are able to find something physical. They are able to eat something. So in one hand, Jesus is this very physical, physical being. But on the other hand, hey, they were in a room. And suddenly Jesus was inside the room. So how are we? To respond to a simple yet direct request. Because Jesus is saying, Feed me. Feed me. Do you remember somewhere in the Gospels? He says, Speak to the others. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. But now Jesus is saying, Feed me. So, what can the disciples offer? They have some boiled fish. I still don't know what boiled fish is as opposed to boiled fish or cooked fish, but I'm something you tell them one day. But there's actually evidence in the early church that as the feeding with the 4,000 or 5,000, there were actually bread and fish Eucharist that happened in the day. And there were actually drawings and painting and illustrations and work on the walls in the early catechisms and catechisms to uh, support that. So Jesus is hungry. He wants to eat. They give him fish. He eats the fish. But perhaps he need to pay attention to what happens next, he opened their minds to the scriptures, understanding to the scriptures. And that's a parallel with the road to Emmaus. As Jesus feeds them, the particular passage the other one, their minds are open to the scriptures. Now Je Jesus is fed by the disciples, and as they do that, their understanding, their minds are open. And that's what we're going to do. Time, we are going to be fed through the Holy Eucharist. And one of the things that we pray for is that our minds will be opened, that our understanding is open to the scriptures so that we can understand. And of course, the scriptures in those days would have been the law and the prophets. And I think we've heard read somewhere the law, it's not the full Bible that we have today, but the law is the law of Moses, the Pentateuch. So, what's that? That's, uh, Genesis and Exodus and uh, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Those were the, the Torah. They would have read the Torah, those five books. And also they would have read the, uh, the prophets.
with his rabbis, with the, I've suddenly gone quiet again. Jesus is also uh, um, a little bit confused with the rabbis, with the, with the religious authorities of the day. Um, because what happened in the Torah, they were given this list, this terrible list of all the rules that they had to do. There were actually 638 of them. Can you imagine remembering 638 rules? Never mind obeying them, just remembering them will be quite, quite something. Beginning, of course, with the first ten, the Ten Commandments. Ah, let me do this one. Oh, there we go. So, beginning with the Ten Commandments. And what are they always shortened to? Well, Jesus shortened them for us. One of the things that Jesus couldn't do was he said, well, let's, let's just shorten them. He was asked, what are the great commandments? And what did he say? We've already said that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart soul and with your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what he shortened them to. He took them from 638 rules to two. Those two important ones for us to remember. So the peace. So Jesus shared the peace with the disciples and we as modern day disciples we're continuing in that tradition of sharing that peace with our fellow disciples and in doing so we are becoming more and more Christ-like. But there's actually a second equally important reason for sharing the peace, and that is gives us an opportunity to reconcile differences. You see, what we're going to do in a few minutes' time is we are going to approach God's table. Think of that for a minute. It's not my table. It's not the church's table. It's God's table. And before we can be in a position to approach God's table, there are two things that, that we have to be very careful about. First of all, we need to confess our sins, and we need to be absolved of them. And we've done that. We've gone through that thing. The second thing is, I can't approach God's table if I've got a grudge against a fellow disciple. Can't do that. That was a source of excommunication in the old days. Excommunication is still there, but it's very rarely used. But unless you were at peace and have the right relationship with your fellow disciples, you can't go and receive God's communion. You can't approach God's table. So the idea of the peace is that you can go to the person that you're holding a grudge against. You can go to the person that you have wronged and you can say, peace be with you. You can say, shalom, shalom, may the world be right. May the world be put right. May you and I take our place in making a better and a better and a better world. That puts a new thing in it, doesn't it? I'm always loving peace. I remember from the first time I just saw it. You get some people who stay in their seats and say, leave me alone. I don't want anybody to talk to me. You get other people who are on their starting blocks. And the minute you say peace, they're off to see how many hands they can shake. 
and in, in the middle of the top heaven, uh, you will get into shine, you will get into stereo, and you will proceed. But really, that is what the peace is about. So we have been forgiven our sins, we have reconciled ourselves with our neighbor, we have read the scriptures, we have heard the scriptures that we've spoken about. Now we are in the right frame, now we are in the right place to approach God's table. Important, isn't it? But we don't really think about that. So think about that in the future. So interestingly, the sharing of the peace was amongst Christians from the very, very early roots. One of the earliest collections of Christian writings called the Didactic. You might hear some people pronounce it as the Didactic. I've never quite figured out which is the correct pronunciation. I say Didactic. And the Didactic speaks about that peace. And the Didactic, and that means the Twelve. The Twelve referred to the teachings of those Twelve uh, Apostles. And it's dated from the middle to the late first century. So that's a really, really early writing, Christian writing, perhaps possibly the earliest writing that we have. And if you ever study uh, theology, you're going to have the didactic coming out of your ears when you, when you start. It's really an important piece of writing. So let's check out. So Jesus, says Luke, is hungry. The risen Lord is hungry. So what in the world are we prepared to offer? What in the world are we prepared to give up for them? How shall our witness, our understanding, the way that we live our lives, how will that satisfy Jesus' hunger? Because that's what he wants. He doesn't really want a piece of royal fish. He wants us. So, is it possible that Shalom is more than just the greeting of orders? It's perhaps a request that all of you like is asking for Shalom. So, are we prepared to give the Shalom as we speak of, as that he spoke of, and as he died of us? So, we need to remember that as we remember peace a little bit later. So, let's see if you're awake. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Well done and be the way. So shalom as we live out your Christian lives this week. Amen.